Our last speaker before dinner, Keith and Kathy Bearden. Give it up. Thanks, everyone. And just so you know, I don't have a George accent, I promise. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I flew up here, and, and Washington's a beautiful state. I've never been up here before. Um, so I actually, you know, when we was coming in, seeing the snow on the mountains and all that, Kathy and I are like trying to take pictures out the window. And, you know, and, you know it's, a, it's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful city. And I actually do kind of like the Seahawks. I just don't pull for them when they're playing the Falcons. So <clears throat> anyway. God still loves you. Yeah, that's right. That's a good thing. <laughs> Hope he always does. But anyway, my name is Keith Bearden and my wife, Kathy, uh, seated over there. And uh, just like Dr. Johnson, he has a, a colleague that um, is with him when, when he goes out. And I'm, Kathy's with me. Uh, almost every time I've ever been out in the last five years, for sure. So she's gotten to see and participate and um, kind of go back just a little brief history. She and I used to ride the school bus together back when we were in grade school. Uh, we were both married to other people and went through uh, 25 years before we actually um, got a divorce and she got a, a divorce or two. Um, and we and we got to seeing each other on Facebook a lot, and we got to talking. And um, after uh, my ex-wife moved out with, uh, with someone else that did me the best favor in the world, Kathy and I got together, and um, it's been it's been great ever since. And I brought her into my world, which I thought she would think I was woo-woo when I first started telling her about some of the things that was going on, but she was. She was not, she, was, she opened her, her eyes and her mind to what I had to say, and she always trusted me. She stood behind me every step of the way that, that we've been through. And so, you know, it's, I dedicate uh, most of everything that I've been able to do to her because for some reason when she came along, everything got better. And that was even with the Sasquatch people. Um, it was, seemed like they connected with, with Kathy. You know, she's... Um, Native American, Creek, whatever, Blackfoot, Cherokee, she's got a mixture of all of them. I don't know what was going on in her town a long time ago. But, uh, somebody was running bare. But anyway, um, this whole thing started with me. I'm actually uh, was born and raised in Georgia. Uh, we, my, my family, my parents, all my friends, Used to love to hunt and still do. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hunter, I'm a deer hunter. I love to get out in the woods. And I've spent many, many, many days in the woods since I was real little. I like to fish. And basically I just love the outdoors, period. Um, what began happening to me about 15 years ago or so were just little bitty things that I overlooked. I never, really didn't even think about being Sasquatch or Bigfoot people related. Uh, little things like hearing knocks at night on trees. You know, I'm thinking, there's some idiot out here every night with a hammer at two in the morning, and he's only driving three nails. You know, and I couldn't figure, I, we would hear it almost every night we'd hear it, and it would happen a couple times spaced out over a couple of hours. And then one night I was, uh, I was out by the campfire, and it was just me by myself that night. I was waiting on some more people to come in. And I kept hearing some rustling in the bushes, and uh, all of a sudden, this low moan started. Oh, and it got louder and louder, and it finished off like a woman screaming. It had the hair on my neck standing up, and my legs were moving. I went to the camper, and I stayed there. It scared me. I had never heard anything like that. Of all my years that I've been out in the woods, I'd never heard anything like that before. So I was starting to hear new things. Now, this was like 10, 12 years ago. Those moments of hearing things and watching things kind of start happening around our camp um, escalated over the next period of years. And so we had other people in our hunting club coming in, talking about hearing sounds of, um, you know, things growling at them when they would go in the woods and, and something that, uh, you know, walking beside them when they're going in and out of their, their hunting areas and it was, you know, it was big. So all of this stuff starts adding up over a period of time. And at one point, about two or three years before I met Kathy, this was about eight years ago, um, my son and I 
happened across um, a track in a creek. It was a big track, barefooted, but it had stepped in the sandbar, so a lot of the features had kind of left, but it was, it was big. So I looked at it, the first thing that I thought about was that Bigfoot thing that I seen on TV not too long, because there was a special on and I was looking, so I'm thinking, nah, that's not what it is. So I brushed it off again, as your mind does. So we have cameras that we put up all over. So, you know, trail cams for the deer and you know, keeping up with the population, we have about 10 of them. So we had this one focused on a crossing on a creek. Uh, the camera was up about six foot and it was aiming down at the creek bottom. And I was going over, was looking, you know, checking cameras. We got to this one, pulled the card out, took it back and checked it. And there was something pretty strange. And you'll see it on here in a few minutes. I'm not, you don't have to go to that right now. But after I saw that, we found another track. This was a little smaller. And this thing that was on the camera was so close to the camera, it widened it out. And you'll see that in a few minutes. But leading up to what I was going to say, you can go into this slide. I used to be pretty stupid about Bigfoot and about things, but I was younger then. I'm not as smart as I am now. You all know when you get white hair, you're smarter than you was when you had dark hair. The ones that have dark hair, I, I know some of you guys that are my age or more, you're putting something on it. I know you are. Because I can't. I mean, I had white hair at 30 years old. But anyway, um, there were so many things that happened, like I said, over the years. You know, odd sounds, bipedal walking. We, we began hearing things. Like when we'd go down and camp, we'd hear things around the campfire. Um, and that's where kind of everything started really escalating. And Joe Hauser, I believe it was you, that was, that was talking about the campfires. It seemed like when we would get together around the campfires and we were all having fun and laughing, almost inevitably we would hear a whistle. And it would happen almost every single time we went. It would start over here and it would go over here and it kind of go back and forth. Then it was similar to a whistle I'd heard earlier from, from someone here. But then we also heard bird whistlings, you know, and it sounded like birds. And of course the owls, every single night we heard owls, they were high-pitched owls and low-pitched owls. We even heard one owl one night that coughed. <laughs> I promise you, he was, he was right in the middle of his hoo-hoo-hoo and it got choked <coughs> and he started coughing. <laughs> so I don't know if the smoke and the fire whipped it his way or whatever. But, you know, we're all starting to think, you know, there's some strange things going on. So, you know, there was one night, my parents had went down earlier, um, and they didn't have, we have a big camper we pull down there now. They had the little truck, you, know, you guys know the camper shells that goes on your truck. They were going to sleep in the back of the truck, and I was coming down that morning. So I got down that morning, and my dad wasn't dressed to go hunting, and I'm like, why aren't you ready to go? He says, I don't think I'm gonna leave your mama up here, out here by herself. I said, well, you know, we've had this property for 30 years, nothing's ever happened, nothing's ever got her. He said, yeah, but you don't know what happened last night. I said, well, what happened? He says, well, she woke me up screaming, said that uh, he was sound asleep, and she woke him up and said, my dad's name's Kenneth, Kenneth, wake up, wake up. There's something shaking the truck. And they said, my mom said the truck was literally shaking back and forth. It did it for maybe two or three seconds, but it was enough to really unnerve her. It was something big to be able to shake the truck. So they told me about that, and I'm, I'm trying to use my mind to figure out what could it be. You know, it's, we don't have bears there. We've never seen a bear in Georgia. So, you know, we uh, chalked it up again to one of those strange things that happens in the night. So... Go to the next slide, babe. We kept uh, going down and you know, having our camp outs at night and the activity increased. There, there was this one night particularly that my son and I had went down and he had a shotgun, it was turkey season, and he was wanting to put a sight on it and shoot it in the middle of the night there at camp. You know, put the lanterns up and shoot it, see if he'd get his gun set up. So he did that and of course it's really still and quiet, just, really pretty night and here he goes blasting this shotgun well he did that broke you know the still of the night and interrupted the night time and i kid you not every coyote around was howling there was howls there was yells there was this and that and then everything got quiet again and you could hear a pin drop it was definitely quiet 
And then those loud screams started, similar to some that I've heard, the Ohio uh, sounds and those. And you know, when I heard those, I knew in my mind, and along with the tracks and all, we have those on our property. At, at that time, I called them Bigfoot. I, you know, now I've changed my tune on what I think they are to what I, what I know they are now. So anyway, going on, go ahead to the next slide. So I go back and, and I start doing some research. And of course, everyone knows this shot here. Um, so Mr. Gimlin and, and Roger Patterson brought this to light. And then through the years, um, I was like anybody else. I had learned about Bigfoot through TV. So the media and the TV and, and what I heard and read through books and magazines, especially the National Enquirer. I knew they were from outer space and they had impregnated a lady, impregnated a lady that went on to become president. Uh, no, I better stop there. So anyway, that's the way things work in, in our culture. You know, we're driven by what we see and what we hear on TV and what we learn. Our brain forms uh, its own ways of putting things together and assimilating you know, facts into something that's really different from what reality really is. So again, that's that's a way I started. Next slide, babe. So here's some of the things that started to happen around our camp. Um, this particular one on the left, it's a little small maple tree and you see that it's snapped and broken. And yeah, we do have deer, but I've hunted enough in my years to know that Usually bug deer is not going to break a thick maple like this without at least leaving signs of his antlers on the tree. There was no mark on this tree whatsoever. It was simply snapped. And where this was, was where we heard bipedal walking around our campfire. And it was always, Joe was like you said, it was always outside the campfire, just far enough out that you couldn't see anything. You could only hear, you could hear the walking. And then the shot there on the, on the right side, um, another hardwood tree just snapped over. And then I became, started became, uh, seeing these, these bends, these twists and bows. Now remember, I'm a deer hunter. I'm not a researcher. I don't know anything about what, I, you know, just what I collected as evidence. And I began to journal. I started writing these things down because in my job, what I do now is root cause analysis. When I go out, visit customers, I look at problems they're having and I try to look at just the problem, cause and effect of what caused the issue and fix it. Whether it's related to the product we sell them to do the, the work or whatever. I'm blinded to everything except for the, the facts. So I started writing everything down because I'm gonna get these facts down and something's gonna help me figure out what's going on because that's the way my mind works. I wanna know more. Let's go to the next slide. So this is the track that I was telling you about later. This is what's spurred my call. Go to the next sign. This is the image that was beside the track uh, when we checked our game camera. This is, two, this is 2009. Uh, my son had his camera. That's his name there. But this was, had walked by the game camera. Now what I, I know this could be anything, right? It could be any kind of animal. Uh, but the, the cool thing about this particular thing, it was so close to the camera and if you guys know how, we we'll use your term, cricks, how the cricks in Georgia run, they're deep, okay? And this, this particular one, we had the camera set and there was, there was an embankment that you'd have to go down. So in order to walk in front of the camera, I was, you know, I put the camera up this high angle down. From where the track was, it was about six and a half foot and the top of the head would have been about top of the camera. So whatever it was, to me, that track was what whatever had walked in front of the camera. So after this one, go to the next one. After this one, I called the BFRO. I went online, got home, called them up, um, sent in my, my little deal on, 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 online so they would you know, see my, what I had going on. And I posted some of the details of, of some of my journals that I'd started. And it was about two or three days and I had a lady named Mary Snyder contact me from the BFRO. She was actually stationed down in Columbus, Georgia. And um, originally she'd worked for the United States Army there at Fort Benning. And so she just, now she was 
at this point. She was actually employed by the Army. She had gotten out and she had a civilian job there as a secretary, but she was also working for the BFRO. So she contacted me. We met in a Waffle House. Now, I'm still a little bit funny about people knowing this. I'm real worried about it getting out because I don't want people to think I'm woo-woo about what's going on. I haven't even told friends, okay? At this point, it's just my immediate family. So we met, we had coffee, and she said things to me that opened my eyes and really caused my mind to go into overdrive about what was going on on my property. So I invited her out. Um, she came out, she brought night vision goggles, she brought all the stuff, and yep, we started finding Bigfoot right there on our property, just like they do on TV. She was doing the, the yells, she was banging on trees, and I, you guys probably figured out what happened. We didn't find a Bigfoot. But what we did find is she started, started showing me evidence that I need to look for. Yeah, find a Bigfoot crew may have it wrong with you know, how they go out and investigate, but I'm telling you, all the people in the BFRO are not like that. It's actually a great organization. Some of the people that I know are in it and have really helped me along the way. Um, so uh, this particular tree bin is one of them. Uh, this one over here, I'm gonna go into a little more detail a little later, go ahead. Tom's Welcome X. This has got a really significant story to it, uh, this particular X, and I'm gonna explain this one in a few minutes a little, little better. Uh, I started finding these on my property, uh, the Welcome X's. At that time, the lady told me from BFRO, she really wasn't sure what they meant. She had heard that they were keep out, like a lot of other people think. So at that point in time, when I'd see one, I'd think, oh, these things aren't too friendly. They want me to stay out of this area. And I would avoid it. I wouldn't even go into that area. Go to the next slide. This is uh, some more stuff that we were finding. And, and some of this right here we're finding today. These are actually recent photos, but um, I will tell you guys right now that I, I'm not a researcher. Um, what I'm sharing with you today are my personal accounts of what happened. And I'm telling you as factual as I know how they're in my book. I just, all my journals and everything that I've done, I put in a book form so I could keep up with it. So when it came time to put this book together, it was fairly easy for me because it's already written out. I just had to connect the dots and make it flow. So we started out with these things like this, and I still haven't seen anything to, to make me think that something was going on. So there was one situation that came up after Mary had left, and we had some ideas of you know what, what they were. My brother came in one day and said, I seen something this morning while I was deer hunting, and I can't explain it. I said, well, what did you see? He said, well, I seen a bear walking up right through the woods. Well, the first thing is we don't have bears there. We haven't had a bear there in over 100 years that's been spotted. So I told him, I said, are you sure it was a bear? He said, yeah, because it dropped all fours and ran over the hill. Now, I would not heard of Bigfoot dropping on all fours back then. I wasn't real sure, but again, I, I still thought that it was probably Bigfoot related based on all the other stuff that we were seeing. So I called Mary up and I told her what happened and she starts logging these things down. There was a... Uh, a few days after that, I think the next week or two, that I was, um, I was actually in, in Mexico at the time, or actually I was on the border of Mexico and rail with Texas uh, there uh, with my job. And, he, and my son and my parents had went down to do some, do some hunting and camping together. And he calls me back and I'm at dinner and he calls me back all frantic. Dad, 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 you're not gonna believe what happened. You're not gonna believe what happened to me. And my mom gets on the phone. She says, you need to calm him down. I think we're gonna to have to take him home. He's flipping out. I said, well, what happened? She says, well, something chased him in the woods. I said, what are you talking about? So he grabs the phone. He said, I'll explain it to you. He said, I heard coyotes howling, screaming, making all kinds of noises. And my dad's, he's had some health issues and, he, and you know, he, he can't bend over too well. And if he does, he may stagger and fall. So we have to be real careful with him. He walks with the cane. He's got a little dog that he, you know, had a, on a leash and he would take the little dog out to walk every single night. And he'd walk it out to the edge of the woods, make a circle and come back. Well, the coyotes got to yelling real loud and they were right at our camp. So my son thought, I'm gonna go out and 
scare these things away. I'm either going to shoot them or I'm going to scare them away. So he goes out <clears throat> and the coyotes are real close and he steps just out of the lantern lot in the bend of the road there and the coyotes have quit howling at this point in time, but he hears something walking in the woods. Walk, and he could hear it, it was bipedal sounding. He said it was big and it was breaking sticks. He said, and then all of a sudden, it came running at me, Dad. I said, it came running at you? He said, yeah, it came running out of the woods. We had 10 foot tall pine trees and they were bending over like somebody running through tall grass. They were bending over and it was running at him. And all he could think of was, I gotta get out of here, it's gonna kill me. So he turns around and he runs as fast as he can back to the camper. Now he's got a shotgun and so he didn't think nothing about that. He got back to the camper and when he got back in, he was terrified to the point that he was crying. And he's a, he was a big kid, he's 16 years old, but he's a big kid. And he was raised in the woods just like I was. <coughs> well, that alarmed me. That alarmed me to the fact that I wasn't sure what I was dealing with. To the point that we were going through some transitional period with had kind of a spat with some family members and we ended up losing that property. And I was actually kind of glad we did because I wanted to get away, get my son away from this property with these things on it because I was really, really worried about him. So as it turned out, we went back down or I went back down a couple weeks later and I found some smaller footprints that were, I don't know, probably, well, the print that you just seen, the, the one in the mud, it was that was it. It was about, what, seven, eight inches long, about four or five inches wide. So and they were also next to a, a bigger female, almost like the patty one back there. We found some almost that big, maybe a little shorter, but they were slender. So when I called Mary, she says, that's probably a female. She's got a young one. So kind of put two and two together and looking at where the tracks were located around our camp. What I think happened that night is he got too close or got between a mother and a young one. Um, so that was kind of how I looked at it. And uh, so at that point, I, I felt a little better about it, but we ended up still losing the property. And when we went to another piece of property, I felt a lot better about it. Um, and I said, well, at least we don't have, you know, the big foot here to, for me to worry about. Now, we're on some new pro property. Go ahead with the next one. And after a few, uh, well, the first year we had nothing. We had no bent trees, heard nothing, had no experiences. I felt there was nothing there. And then one spring, uh, we were down there, and I walked by and I find this tree. Now, I don't know if you can see, but there's green on this pine. This is a green pine tree, it's not dead. And it was pulled over, and this happened overnight. We were down there on a Saturday, and I, and I drive right by here on my four-wheeler to go hunting. And it was there uh, the following morning. It wasn't there the day before. And on the end of the pine, there's an old dead tree that you can see there. At the end, that tree was actually sitting further back and grass had grown around it. And there's a stump where the tree came from. They drug the, the, the dead tree up and pinned that one down. I'll go to the next slide. So then I'm thinking, what's going on? We got these things here now, you know, am I gonna, do I need to worry about this? And then uh, we found these deer skulls stacked up. And I'm thinking, they were in our camp and they were stacked in such a fashion that something had put them there. There was some vertebrae and some skulls that were just kind of stacked up. And somebody was talking about bone structure or bone stacks or whatever. I'd never seen that before that. My son didn't take a picture of the stack. He just put them in the back and brought them home. Go to the next slide. Well, <clears throat> lo and behold, um, what had happened, and I actually kind of sl slipped by this on the, from the other hunting property. We had a situation came up that I was sitting in a, on, a top of a, on top of a ridge and there was a draw down below me and that draw had a lot of deer tracks. It was a natural funnel area for all the hunters that know what funnel areas are. And the deer would run up and down that. When I was sitting on the ridge one morning, I heard a commotion. I heard leaves rustling, I heard something running, I heard sticks breaking, a lot of, a lot of noise. And then I heard a deer scream. If you ever heard a deer when it gets caught, it's like a high pitched, bawling sound, just ah, really, really loud. I jump up, I run down the hill, and when I got over the ridge, I could see the belly of the deer, and then I looked up and I seen something huge and black run past where the deer was into the pines behind, and I could see the pines moving. 
immediate thought was somebody just killed this deer and they were real close to it and they ran off. Then I got to thinking about how big that was that went by and now I'm thinking, is, was that a, a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch? We go down and take a look at the deer and I don't know if you can tell, but the deer's neck is broken. That wasn't twisted like the one that Joe was talking about earlier, but it's broken and the vertebra is almost sticking out its neck. No other mark on the deer. I looked at the deer and, and my son and we took pictures of it. Of course, I didn't touch it. And I wasn't, you know, wasn't de definitely wasn't gonna try to drag that thing out and get rid of it or bury it. Um, I was actually afraid at that point, so we, we left. And the next day or the next weekend when we came back, the deer was nowhere to be found. But in its place of where it was, there was a big, huge pile of poop. It's about that big around, about that high. I don't know why I did that. Maybe it was just showing me, you know. <laughs> don't come in my spot or you might be my poop. <laughs> so go ahead to the next slide. Now, we're going to talk about this story in a minute. I want to catch up on the new, uh, the new lease when we started having all these things happen. Um, it got to the point to where I'm really, really excited about what's going on. I'm, I'm online and I'm researching, I'm doing my deal. I'm on forums all over the place. I'm on the Bigfoot forums. Uh, met a buddy of mine today that was on the Bigfoot forums too with me back years ago when it was started. I ended up being an admin there for a while. So I'm jumping around, I'm in everything. I'm doing things online, I'm researching. And I ran across on Facebook, Mel Ketchum. She started talking to me a little bit about what she had going on. And one of the things that she did that changed my life right then and there, it's nothing she told me, but it was someone she introduced me to, and that was Arla Williams. And I know she's a reoccurring th uh, name that you've heard all day today and you've heard yesterday, but Arla Williams uh, immediately became my friend on Facebook. We chatted not minutes, but hours, because she would answer any question I had and she enjoyed it. Um, not too long after that, I got her phone, we were chatting on the phone. So now things are escalating. We moved to this new property and you know things are really getting to be fun because now I'm thinking what she's telling me is putting a new spin on what I thought. These things aren't as evil as I thought because she's seen them ever since she was young. Well, too long after that, I met Mr. Tom Cantrell online. First started out as cutting up about football and Seahawks and Falcons, and I've, we've been doing that for a while. But uh, as as it kind of grew and I, I started meeting people online. I found out real quick there were some really, really good people online and there were some that weren't too good online. So I kind of was careful about who I said what to. I started really kind of keeping my friends close. The ones I trusted, I kind of formed a little circle. And those are the ones that I confided in. Uh, we all went to Alex, Alex is one that you were talking about. There was this young kid there named Elijah. Elijah was really, really excited about the form. He was uh, he was there every single day sitting on the front row and he would listen to every single speaker with big wide eyes and he was so glad to be there. Uh, the one Saturday night we actually went out on the hillside behind the, uh, the complex there and um, we, Alex went out and was playing his flute and there were a few people around and Elijah was really just in awe and then all of a sudden we started hearing walking in the woods and then we seen eyes just popping up big eyes and they were very tall off the ground and you could hear them walking. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. So I'm kind of living my time there through Elijah's eyes. So I think everybody that met Elijah got to really love this kid. He was so, and Tom's shaking his head, yes, he agrees. This kid was so exciting to be around and so fun that you know it just made my time better. Um, after the forum was over with, uh, he had a great time and uh, the very last day of the forum, his mom came up to me. She says, can you talk to him? I said, talk to him about what we're getting ready to leave. We're packing up. She said, well, he's so sad that it's over with. He's crying. So I went over. I said, Elijah, what's wrong? He said, I don't want it to end. I had so much time. I don't want it to end. I said, well, look, just you come back and we have another one or I'll call you. We'll take you out. We'll do some things together. He says, well, I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that the Bigfoot would show me a sign that they were real last night and they would show me a sign before I left. And there was a, something really unique happened. 
instead of me trying to tell you from my memory, I wrote it all down that night and I put it in, in this form and I'll read it to you so I don't miss any details. Uh, and I go back to where the night was, was very interesting to say the least. This was not on the hill. So we had a few researchers there and uh, what Alex had brought us wooden flute and he played it on the hill. We could hear them walking, we could see the movement. The boy was so excited to see it. Um, as we were leaving the conference area going down the road, we had driven several times a day. We went by this same road, going to the store, going to Walmart, right, Tom? Uh, we had driven the same way. As we were leaving and we were pulling out of the conference center, we went about 200 yards. This was on the side of the road. <clears throat> the, uh, you know, if you've seen these, if you studied any uh, Native American culture, you know what ish, ish, I may not be pronouncing this right, Ishnooks, is that the right pronunciation, Tom? But they're, you know, a lot bigger. They look a lot like this, but smaller. Tom can't understand me because I'm from Georgia. I don't know what his problem is. <laughs> so anyway, you know, so my whole thing is, I don't, know, I don't know for sure that the Sass made this or the Bigfoot people made this for Elijah, but I know Elijah seen it because Elijah stopped right behind my car and you'd never seen such a big smile in your whole life. He actually was so happy, he was jumping up. I told you, I knew they knew, I knew they were here. They showed me, they did this for me and he thinks they did it for him. So in my mind, they did. All right, next slide. All right, the stack rocks. We've been finding the stack rocks along our property. This was a little blurry, but this particular incident, I was out turkey hunting one day and I heard some noises uh, kind of in the bushes and then all of a sudden this bird starts making this really, really loud noise to the point that it was irritating me. You know, I'm sitting there and I'm trying to enjoy the peace of the quiet of the woods and I can't even hear myself think because this bird's over here going every few seconds it stopped it started again. So I stood up after about 15 minutes and I'm going to go throw a rock at this bird and chase it off. <laughs> so I go over to where this bird is and it stops. So I'm sitting there and I'm, where'd it go? Well, maybe it's gone. Pull my chair out and I'm going to sit down and all of a sudden it started again over here. <laughs> and I'm like, this is really irritating. So I'm going to find this bird. So I go over the hill. And when I went over the hill, I seen something dark move. I'm thinking it's a turkey at first, right? And I looked down, there was this rock stack. Uh, the one here, the, the bottom rock, it's hard as hell with this picture, but it's this big around and probably 400 pounds maybe. It was actually in a road bed there and it had been dug out of the road bed. There was an empty void, there was a hole there. Rock was stacked and there was rocks rock stacked on top of it. And I knew at that point, they were calling me over to show me this rock stack. Go to the next slide. Arla, from that point forward, I was on the phone with her. I was on uh, Facebook. We were talking um, a lot. We were really, really, she was sharing a lot of information, and my mind's just clicking about all these things that were going on. Go ahead to the next slide. There's another guy. You guys probably recognize him. He looks better in that picture. <laughs> another one of my, I call my mentors. He's, he's shared a lot with me. Go to the next slide. This little guy, this is Kathy's grandson, it's Hunter. We took Hunter down there with us and we were camping out. And um, I had an, another researcher friend of mine came down and she brought a bag of apples. Now, like I said, I am just a hunter. I'm here sharing my story of what's happened. Do I, am I a researcher? Well, I guess I am because I research it totally all the time and I'm in the woods all the time and I'm looking for stuff. So I guess by definition I am. But when Hunter would go down, we'd go camp. We had that bag of apples, there were seven of them. And the seven apples, uh, we were gonna go put them out somewhere and we we're gonna try to gift the Bigfoot. So the same area where the pin tree was that I just showed you, there was a leaned over tree, right? Well, that leaned over tree is where I thought would be a good place for the apples. So Hunter takes the apples out and he starts putting them on this tree. He gets the first apple up there, second, third. He gets to the sixth apple and the sixth apple rolls off. Picks it up, puts it back in, it rolls off. Finally, I said, look, son, you're not gonna get it to stay. Just put the last two on the stump. There was a stump right beside there. So he puts the last two on the last two apples on the stump. 
I threw him on the four-wheeler and we came back to camp. We had, you know, grilled out and had a good time around the fire. Didn't really hear a whole lot that night. But the next morning, I get on my four-wheeler and I'm going to ride down and video these apples and see what's going on, you know, with them. I don't really think there's a lot going to happen that I'm going to know as Bigfoot. I figure, well, if the apples are gone, a deer got them, right? Or a coon or whatever. So I get there and the first thing I notice, and I got my, my video out, there was one apple on a stump. So I thought, ah, something got the apple. Not a big deal. Then I turned the camera over to the trees. There were six apples on the trees. There was six apples there. There was five. He could only get the five on there. So instead of taking the apples, he moved the apple and put it on the tree. So you think they're not watching you when you're in the woods? They know when you're out there. They know the minute you get out of the vehicle that you're there. And those type of interactions and that particular interaction there turned my whole thought process. They are not an animal. They are a type of person. They can think, they can reason. They seen honor put, try to put those apples up there and it wouldn't stay. So they showed him that it could be done. So next, jokers. Oh yeah, they're jokers. See this oak tree here? If you notice, the, the pines that we have on our hunting property, there were no oaks. This is all planted pines. They'd come out, the forestry service would come out and clean out every other row. Well, I used to drive this little road down to where my hunting area was on my four-wheeler. I'd take it and I'd drive down the road. Well, one day I come up on this tree. And I think, how did an oak tree get in this pine field? There wasn't, you know, there's no oaks here. So I drug it out of the way and I go down and I hunt and I come back up. Guess what's in the tree, in the trail? Same tree. <laughs> so I'm thinking, how's that happen? There, there's nobody down there but us. I've got a lock gate. So I drug it out of the trail again. We end up going home that night. My son comes down there the next two days later. And he calls me up. He said, Dad, he said, did you, why didn't you move that tree? You told me you had a down tree in the trail. I said, I did move that tree. He said, well, it was back this morning. So it ended up, he moved it. The next weekend I went down, the same thing, it's there again. So I grabbed the tree this time and I took it as far as I could take it. It didn't come back that time. But I mean, I can just envision the little guy over in life. Hey, look at him. <laughs> Fat boy had to get off and do something. <laughs> so go to the next one. Okay, now all of this is leading up to, to the point that when Arla and I got together and started talking, we were starting to learn a lot of things. We decided to have a Georgia camp out. She's going to come to Georgia and camp with us. Uh, the first year we did this, uh, a couple years ago. Well, the deal is, is we left that other camp where we saw the rock stack, and we went well, to this one. Right. Yeah, the property we had where the rock stack was and all the, the trickster stuff, we left that camp because we had gotten our old property back in the meantime. And so I was looking for a place to have our Georgia camp out. And uh, Arla was coming, so I had to get this thing found. Well, immediately in my mind, I thought of a place that I'd never been there before. So this place was only about you know, 10 miles from where our property was. I, it's beside the Chattahoochee River in Georgia. It's a really, really big place. And again, whoever said, I think it was Joe again maybe, about go to parks. This was a park. This was a county park that people were at every single day. But... I was led to this park. There was something in my mind said to go there. We went there in the afternoon. I got out of the car. We had an immediate smell in our nose that was really, really strong. I'd never smelled the Bigfoot before, but everything that anybody ever told me about it, that's what it smelled like. And people ride horses. And people ride horses in that park too. So there's a lot of people there and it's been there a long time. Now this particular park uh, is where General George McIntosh of the uh, Creek Indian uh, Nation is buried. And there's a story about that I don't have time to get into, but you can check it out online. He's buried here. This was also the reservation where the Creek Indians lived for many, many centuries until they got driven out on the Trail of Tears. So this was a very special place for Native Americans. And thusly, I'd already been doing my research and talking to Arla, and there was some kind of connection that I think there is with Native Americans and, and the Bigfoot people. We found this park. Kathy and I get out of the car and we start walking down a ridge and uh, go to the, let's not, go up, go down one slope. Yeah, well, I'll go back up to the other one. All right, we start going down this ridge and we hear something down on the bottom. We kept smelling this smell and we could hear walking going along with us. 
Well, we go down a little ways and this whitetail doe comes flying up out of the bottom where the, where the creek was, up over the ridge and she's, she's really frightened. You could tell she was. She almost ran over the two of us. And we keep walking down and we keep, hear these things walking beside us, you know, on the creek. So it was getting kind of close to dark, so we kind of backed ourselves back out. And I wanted to go and see if there was any tracks beside the creek, because there was another trail that went beside the creek. Uh, the creek. And there's one of the tracks that we found that, that evening, and we took the photo. Okay, now you... We saw the baby tracks. Oh, yeah. I need to give you a micro. We found a baby, we found a baby track about that big that was with this one, but it was kind of getting dark, so you couldn't see it really, really well. So that baby track, she was all just giddy over the baby track. Oh, it's so cute, look at it. <laughs> so now you can go to the next one. So it comes time for our Georgia camp out after we find this, this wonderful area that we're getting ready to do our third at. First year we had about, uh, what time, 20, 30 people at, and we had uh, several campers. And of the 20 or 30 people, it was one of the best camp out experiences with the researcher people that came that I've ever experienced. We had visuals, we had nighttime movements, we had howling at night, we had whistles. We had 10 or 12 people that first time actually had visuals that seen them. Uh, so they were in and out of camp. What's that? I said, and we got chiggers. Well, yeah, we got chiggers. Uh, this, one, this thing here, this is one of the gifts that they left. Uh, this is an, a welcome sign, and see it intertwined there? That's Arla holding it up with the vines. Go to the next slide. Um, of course, the tracks, there are tracks all over this place. You can't hardly go there and put in a little bit of time without finding a track at some point. Go to the next one. Uh, here's another track here. I think you can make it out. We've got a cigarette lighter down there in its place. Go to the next one. Um, like I said, I don't know that much about glyphs, but yeah, did we find glyphs? We were finding them everywhere. They were all in camp. Arlen and Tom, you know, they're over checking these things out. So. You know, it was pretty apparent to me that we found the right location and they were there. So that made things much better. Go to the next one. Some of my buddies, somebody was talking about uh, my buddy Pat White, uh, a bully worker on the forums. He brought some video, or not video, but sound equipment. He set it up. We got some really, really good audio. I didn't bring it with me today because I wanted to ask his permission first because he recorded it and I always ask permission before I share and I couldn't get in touch with him. Go to the next one. Uh, this particular one, and I don't know if you can see it, but Tom Cantrell's head there, if you can see it. See the little, can you make out the dot back there? The little dot? Yeah, right over his head. If I had a pointer, I'd show it to you. But it's like sitting on the bill of his hat. There was, there was a Bigfoot that was seen the very next night. That was by Arlo's tent. Is exactly where this is. It's an eye shine. That's what it is. Oh, at the top, red button. Yeah, okay. It's right there. And I didn't even know it was in the photo until we did it. And then we kind of blow it up. You can't see it on this very good. But yeah, there's something standing, and it's pretty high because it's looking over the top of Arlo's head. You go to the next one. And there's some more things we found. Go to the next one. This one here, there's a tree balanced on the very top. Over here, it's balanced on the other side, and I don't have enough sense to get a picture of that, but I got this side. <laughs> Go ahead. And of course, these, you know, these are there. Go to the next one. Uh, this one here is, um, anytime we'd walk in and out, and that's actually where I'm going to go to on this next story to finish, the, finish it out. Uh, you see the up here on the top, the, the little guy looking there over the ridge. And this is actually right up here. Anytime we would go in and out of my area that I call it now, I have two, I call them guards, will follow me in. They'll be on either side of me and they follow me in, they follow me out. You can hear them walking sometimes, you can catch them out of the corner of your eye. And then you turn around and look, they stop. This time we sna uh, snapped a picture and there he is right there, peeking over the top. Go to the next one. Okay, this story. I got two stories to finish this off with. I'll add a little more here, but I talk too much. I talk too slow is what I've heard. So anybody else's an hour thing takes me two hours to tell it. <laughs> the night the lights went on in Georgia, this is one of the most outstanding things that I'd ever had happen. Last spring, I 
had some guys who were wanting to go to Georgia and I was not able to be there and camp with them, but I promised them that Kathy and I would join them on a Saturday night if they'd hang around. Um, so we, we showed up, it was in May of last year and uh, they had some kids with them. It was four other guys um, and they wanted to go to my area. They wanted to see a Bigfoot. I want to see a Bigfoot. So I said, well, you know, they're not a Bigfoot, they are people. So I've, I've always, you know, tried to change people's mindset. I want that to be known more than anything else. They are people. So I call them Bigfoot people. So I said, they're Bigfoot people, but I'll go out and we'll try. I can't promise anything. So we go out to the area. Right before we get there, there's some people camping. So I asked them the permission to go, you know, park my truck here. I'm going to go down this trail. Uh, and we're just going to go walking down the woods. She says, I don't know what y'all are walking in the woods this late at night for, but are y'all looking for a baby? And I said, what? She said, there's a baby crying in those woods. It's been crying all afternoon. And I thought, well, I need to let somebody know. I thought maybe it was some people in there, but it's dark and I can still hear it. So I said, well, we'll check it out for you. Remember the baby tracks I told you about? I knew what it was. So anyway, we go into the woods and I've got these, these guys with me, the four guys with me. We're walking in, they pick us up on both sides of the trail. We walk down. Um, and while we're there, we hear a loud whistle. I can't do it exactly like I heard it. But just kind of like that. And so we stopped and the whistle was behind us. We turned around and kind of went back and we stopped and we're looking. And on the top of the hill, I see a light, like a you know big shining light on the hill. I'm thinking, what is that light? So that light moves down the hill and we can hear walking. You can hear the foot. As it got closer, it was louder, and it was louder. Till it got within about, I'd say, 30 feet. When it got within 30 feet, that big light had turned into two eyes. It was a white light, and it looked to me like two pin lights, you know, two little pin lights, side by side, about eight inches. But they were blinking. You could see the eyes blinking. And there was a tree in front of it. Now, these eyes weren't shining or reflecting. I had no flashlight on. It was making its own light. These lights, and when it would turn, you could see in front of it, it was like flashlights. I'd never seen that before. I'd heard it mentioned, but I've seen it. And the, not only me, but the other four guys that were with me had seen it too. So we're standing there, and Jason had his dog on a leash. Jason decided to do a greeting grunt. So he does a greeting grunt. This thing's eyes went from white to orange immediately. Bright red orange. And you could see the squint, and all of us felt in danger to that. I didn't feel comfortable standing there. I told him, don't do that again. I calmed the Bigfoot person down. I apologize. Sorry about that. We didn't mean it. We weren't trying to be respectful. So after a couple minutes, he turns and he walks off. And we all felt relieved, but we we're all excited. So we go back to tell Kathy what happened. So, you know, that was one thing. We had our next camp out, and I'm trying to speed this thing up because I'm down to two minutes, right? So we get back to the uh, to the to the camp, I tell Kathy, we have the next uh, get together. Now this last one, this last fall, was bigger than any I had and better than I thought that we'd had. Almost everybody had visuals that night. They were in our camp, and Tom had one picking in his tent at him one night when he woke up. Um, so they were just being seen by everybody. And I mean, right in our camp. Uh, the one night we carried Arla, my wife, Gil Forrest, a guy named Scott Hanson. He's chief magistrate judge down in Savannah. Uh, he had never had any experience, so I took him with me. We go down to the area where we had the eye shine. And there's this big, huge hill over to the right. We're going down the trail, and of course, my two guys pick us up as we go, and you can hear them walking with us. And you see an eye shine. You can pick up eye shine here and there. We get down to this area, and all of a sudden, I see him up on top of the hill. The big guy, he's about 10 foot tall. He comes down the hill. Now, this night was was bright, it was a bright moon, it was, I think it may have been full moon. So you could see really, really well, almost like daylight. So when he's coming down, I'm saying he looks white because the light's shining on him, but he's actually a, a beige or a blonde color when I've seen him in the daylight, and I've, I've got a photo on my phone of him. But anyway, as he's coming down the hill, as he's walking, there is a presence that he has, and now we're gonna get into some woo in a minute. But this presence that he had was, was a, like a charged electrical field. It was so powerful, you could feel it. The guy behind me had the uh, parabolic mic said the mic was crackling like it was in a thunderstorm. 
the whole time. He walks to the middle of the trail and he stops and he stands and he turns and he's looking at us. Just like this. He's got his hands down beside him. Arlen says, Keith, you need to walk forward. Mm, okay. <laughs> I walk forward because I'm, I'm a little concerned. You know, I'm, I felt better about him, but this guy's big. I mean, he's big. So I walked forward a little bit. She said, keep going, keep going. <sighs> okay. So I kept going. Well, I got to me to you from him. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at him. And while I'm looking at him, I don't say anything. Now here's the big woo-woo. In my head, I started seeing flashes of things going on. I started like I was seeing a movie in fast, fast motion, just glimpses of Bigfoot doing this and doing that and talking and moving here, going across country, running through the woods, catching deer. Just all this stuff was just flashing and flashing. And I'm like, what is going on? So what I thought was a long time, I thought it was like 30 minutes, I felt completely drained when it stopped. I turned around, I looked back, and I'm ready to kind of back up because I really, I feel drained. I even, I feel dizzy-headed. But every hair on me, on my body is standing up at this point. And Kathy, tell them what you seen when I walked forward. When he and Arla walked forward and Scott and I were standing back, Keith and Arla disappeared. We couldn't see them. Or I couldn't see them. And then I told Arla, I mean, I couldn't see them, but I still, I walked forward. And when I walked forward, I felt my feet come off the ground. It was the weirdest thing. It was woo-woo. <laughs> it was. It was really, really weird. But Well, the unique thing about this and the unique thing about our area in Georgia is um, I've always got somebody with me. I carry people out there and the people that I trust, the people that I want to be around me and want to be in my circle. And I share this with them because, you know, our story and all of you guys in this room we have a story that needs to be told. You guys need to get out there and explain to people that they are much more than a Bigfoot creature. They are not that. They are a person. They are a primal people. They need the respect that they deserve. And the one thing I want to close with, and these nice young college people have been doing this documentary on the environment, be respectful to the Bigfoot. Be respectful to the environment around the Bigfoot because that's what they're after. They want your respect. They want their story to be told in a respectful way. More and more people are having uh, the same things that were happening happen in their areas. It all has to do with that one word and that's total respect. And one it starts things, with us. Sorry, one of the things that Arla has taught us is when you go in the woods, talk to them. I mean, you may not be able to see them, but talk to them. Tell them you're there. Tell them that you're not going to hurt them. Tell them that you respect them in the woods. And I promise you it will make a difference. Yep. Just imagine this as I close the last thing here. is Just imagine yourself going into someone's home. If you're going to go to someone's home, do you just go barging in? No, you call and say, hey, we're on our way. Or you knock on the door. Hey, it's me. I'm coming over to eat dinner because I don't want to cook tonight. Whatever. Do that with a Bigfoot, be very respectful. I go out there before we have our get togethers, I announce to them what we're gonna be doing the next week, who's gonna be there. I do it every single time and I try to be repetitive when I do that. And I'm always very respectful when I go there. Pick up all the trash, put everything away, keep the area and the earth clean. And that's my story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.